Good afternoon, everybody. Um, many thanks for this opportunity. Uh, today, on behalf of our research team, the RENA research team, I'm going to present some national um, data on anemia and its management among uh, chronic um, kidney disease. It's known that anemia is one of the major complications of chronic kidney disease. And recently, um, from a large population-based study, an NHANES-based study, uh, it has been estimated that 15% of those with chronic kidney disease uh, would be anemic. And uh, there is substantial evidence that not only associate anemia with uh, a reduction of quality of life or uh, higher costs, but also with the risk of progression into end-stage kidney disease and even mortality. However, uh, there is little or there is paucity of data when it comes to the Irish health system. Therefore, we conducted a study with an objective to estimate the prevalence of anemia among chronic kidney disease patients, qu quantify the burden of iron deficiency, and finally, explore current management practices, including patterns of treatment and investigations. Our study was a multi-center cross-sectional study, including chronic kidney disease patients attending renal, cl uh, renal clinics in six different geographical areas in the Republic of Ireland. The sample was a convenient one of consecutive patients attending renal clinics in the first two weeks of 2012 and 2013. Data were collected through medical record review and uh, we used a standardized data tool. Uh, all the data uh, were collated, analyzed at our center. Uh, ethical approval was granted from UL Ethics Committee. Um, we used SAS, uh, the program SAS, to produce our descriptive statistics. And for the sake of comparison, we used uh, chi-square tests and uh, ANOVA. So um, we utilized uh, different definitions uh, of anemia. First, we used the WHO criteria, which defines anemia by having a hemoglobin that's less than 13 in men and a hemoglobin that's less than 12 in women. We also use different thresholds to define anemia, hemoglobin less than 12, less than 11, and less than 10. Iron deficiency uh, state was defined by having either a serum ferritin that's lower than 100 uh, nanogram per milliliter or a lower transferrin saturation, lower than 20%. So we had in this study about uh, a total of 530 patients, uh, 461 of whom had available hemoglobin measurements, and uh, 464 with available uh, creatinine measurements, uh, enabling us to measure their creatinine or EGFR, glomerular filtration rate. The mean age was uh, uh, 57, and 55% of our uh, cohort were males. Uh, the mean hemoglobin was 12.6. Um, almost 40% of this cohort had uh, chronic kidney disease stage 3, and the remainder were equally distributed between chronic kidney uh, CKD stage 1, 2, and 4, and 5. So um, here in this graph, we can see the geographic distribution of the cohort, and uh, the largest three proportions of the cohort were basically from uh, Dublin Northeast, uh, followed by uh, the West, and uh, the third was the Midwest. Um, the Northwest contributed uh, uh, to about 13% of this cohort, 10% uh, from the uh, Midland, and 7% from the Southeast. So the estimated prevalence of anemia was generally high, especially when we used the WHO criteria. Almost half of the cohort fulfilled this criteria. And with lower hemoglobin thresholds, the prevalence went down. So for instance now, uh, the prevalence of hemoglobin less than uh, 10, which is a very severe uh, anemia here, was 6%. We explored the relationship between um, the level of hemoglobin and kidney function, and we found that the mean hemoglobin would decrease significantly with worsening uh, chronic kidney disease or kidney function. Okay. And uh, beyond the established relationship between hemoglobin and kidney function, we studied the relationship between anemia prevalence and different stages of chronic kidney disease. 
we found again that the prevalence would increase significantly with worsening CKD stages. These findings was consistent across all studied anemia thresholds. For instance, uh, if we look here at the purple uh, bars, which uh, basically correspond to the uh, anemia definition by the WHO, we can see as we move from stage one and two, the, the prevalence goes up significantly. Then we compared the prevalence of anemia between different regions using the same cutoff points. Now, although there were some variations uh, between the regions, but those changes uh, or those differences uh, did not reach any statistical significance. Um, in other words, uh, the variation here are due to random um, variations only. And then we looked at testing rates for iron deficiency um, states. Iron testing in our cohort or in our study was defined by the availability of either ferritin or transferrene saturation within six months prior to the clinic visit. Uh, the overall rate for testing was about uh, 34%. And then we looked specifically at testing rates within anemia, uh, anemic patients using different thresholds. Expectedly, rates went up for those with lower hemoglobin levels. So for those with hemoglobin that's less than 10, 68% of them were, uh, their iron, uh, uh, iron st statuses were uh, tested, uh, leaving about uh, 30 or 32% without any uh, available iron studies. We estimated the prevalence of iron deficiency generally among those who were tested uh, for, iron, uh, um, for iron status. And we found that 46% were having either a low, a low ferritin that's less than 100 or a low T saturation that's less than 20%. Then we looked at the prevalence of anemia therapy in this cohort. Uh, the anemia in, in this, uh, the anemia of ther uh, the, uh, the therapy for anemia here was indicated by um, the availability of um, erythropoietin stimulating agents or uh, ion therapy. So generally 5% of the entire cohort were on some sort of ion therapy, 7% of them were uh, on erythropoietin agent and 10% were on either. And for those who were documented to be iron deficient, only 14% of them were receiving some sort of ion therapy or, or IV. Um, this figure here basically shows the prevalence of anemia treatments within anemic patients. Now, approximately, for instance, if we take uh, the, uh, the less than 12 uh, category, fifth of these patients were on some sort of treatment. And for those with hemoglobin less uh, than um, uh, 10, only 36% of them were treated. So, um, in summary, uh, the prevalence of anemia was substantial in Irish chronic kidney disease patients. The prevalence of iron deficiency was um, very common as well. Testing rates for iron deficiency were really low, and the treatment rates uh, with uh, erythropoietin stimulating agents or iron therapy were equally low. And I suppose we can conclude from this that both anemia and iron deficiency states were common among Irish chronic kidney disease patients. And uh, there is low testing rates and underuse of treatments. Um, it's worth mentioning generally that uh, along this study we conducted a survey looking at the uh, structure of renal clinics and strikingly we found that only 47% of these clinics were equipped by, uh, with uh, algorithms uh, to, um, to guide the treatment. So um, we advocate here or we, we think actually that greater use of anemia management algorithms uh, probably uh, utilizing electronic el uh, alert system and more involvement of uh, uh, nurse specialists might improve the, uh, this area. I'd like to acknowledge all, uh, all those actually who participated in this project. Thank you. My name is Els Gillis and I'll be presenting you on the patterns of recovery from acute kidney injury 
and the risk of kidney disease progression in the Irish population. Um, I was very fortunate as an intern to be part of uh, this exciting research under the Department of Nephrology and Medicine in the University Hospital of Limerick. Before I start to outline our methods and our results, I would like to illustrate the background to this research using a case of acute kidney injury that was reported by the National Inquiry, um, the National Confidential Inquiry into Patients, Death and Outcome. In this case, an elderly patient was admitted with a fractured neck neck of femur. The patient was known to have chronic kidney disease and was known to be on two different diuretics, but the electrolytes on admission didn't show any deterioration, so the patient was known to have surgery. Post-op, the patient developed a worsening of renal function consistent with pre-renal failure. This was noted and recorded, however, the diuretics were not uh, discontinued and the patient wasn't given inadequate IV fluids. And just using this case, because I think it rings a bell with many of us, I think we see many cases of acute kidney injury on the wards. And it's a common um, complex disease process that occurs in at least one in five hospitalized adults. Um, it is a common and preventable cause of mortality and morbidity. Unfortunately, in this case, the patient until me died of AKI. But what we more often see is different degrees of recovery from AKI. And recent evidence has suggested that the degree of recovery from AKI is an important determinant for long-term clinical outcomes. However, to date, there is very limited data available on the patterns of recovery in the Irish health system, as well as the clinical outcomes. Therefore, our main objectives was to determine the incidence of AKI in the Irish health system, to describe the patterns of recovery, and to explore the association of the recovery status with the subsequent risk of kidney disease progression. To do so, we used an observational retrospective cohort of patients with, uh, from the Northwest Regional Health System with serum creatinine measurements between 2005 and 2011. The definition, definition and uh, diagnosis and severity of AKI were based on serial creatinine measurements following the Kidaigo classification. Recovery from AKI was considered complete if renal function returned to nearly normal to nearly baseline within 28 days post the acute event. We talked about partial recovery if the recovery remained between 1.1 and 1.5 times the baseline. And failure to recover was considered when the creatinine continued to remain above 1.5 times the baseline or there was a need for dialysis within 28 days of the initial rise. Kidney disease progression then was defined as time to 50% decline and estimated glomerular filtration late from baseline in those survivors of the acute um, event that didn't need dialysis. We used Koch's regression then to look at the association between the recovery status and the risk of kidney disease progression. Overall, we found 25,744 uh, separate events of acute kidney injury, given an incidence rate of 20 acute injury events per thousand people years. As you can see, events were more, go, sorry. As you can see, the events were more common in men than in women, and they increased significantly and substantially with advancing age, ranging from 2.8 to 207 AKI events per thousand people years. The period trend below shows that the events were high throughout <coughs> period that we investigated and that the events were consistently higher in men than in women. When we looked at recovery, we found that complete recovery was observed in over 40% of the patient. In 12.4% of the patients, here, you see that there was a failure to recover, amounting in just over 3,000 individuals. We can see that the patterns of recovery didn't change throughout the period and this is most likely because there was no change in clinical practice. One of the main core objectives of our study was to look at the association between the recovery status and the risk of kidney disease progression as defined by a decrease in estimated glomerular filtration rate of 50% from baseline. In this multivariant analysis, you can see that a male gender and a lower baseline um, actually inferred a greater risk for progression to kidney disease. But more importantly, we showed a very significant association between um, the recovery status and the subsequent um, risk of disease progression. When we took here people that had a complete recovery as a referent, 
those people with partial recovery had a 48% increased risk um, for kidney disease progression, and those people that failed to recover had a six-fold higher risk. As you see there. Okay. In total, 282 of the acute and um, uh, kidney injuries went on to have uh, immediate and stage kidney disease. This was defined as either a glomerular filtration rate below 10 or those that needed immediate dial dialysis. Indeed, when we looked at um, the association between AKI and long-term risk of dialysis, we found that um, the AKI resulting in immediate dialysis contributed to between 12, as you see here, 12 and 45% of the instant dialysis population. What does that really mean? That is, if we take out the dialysis patients to start in a given year, that in approximately 25% of the patients, there was an, a preceding acute kidney injury. So just to summarize, this is the first study to describe the patterns of recovery from acute kidney injury in the Irish health system and its deleterious impact on kidney disease progression. We found that um, AKI is extremely common in our health system. It is higher in men than in women and it is age dependent. We've also shown that lack of recovery from acute kidney in injury predicts disease progression and more importantly that acute kidney injury contributes substantially to end-stage kidney disease requiring dialysis. So I think it's very important that we get a greater awareness of acute kidney injury and our findings which suggest that greater efforts be afforded to the prevention, detection and follow-up of these patients so that we can reduce avoidable complications. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. My name is Rob Weidemeyer. I'm a fourth year medical student at the University of Limerick. On behalf of myself and uh, my colleagues at the Graduate Entry Medical School and the University Hospital Limerick, I'd like to present changes in STEMI management in the Midwest of Ireland with the advent of modern PCI facilities. Uh, just to start uh, with an introduction, uh, STEMI is ST elevation myocardial infarction, which is the most serious categorization of heart attack, and we're referring to uh, blockage of uh, coronary artery and ischemia or, inf or infarction of the, the territory distal to that. Thrombolysis, uh, there's two, uh, two managements for, uh, for ST elevation myocardial infarction and that's clearance of the blockage either by thrombolysis which is cl uh, clot busting drugs or percutaneous coronary intervention which is uh, also known as PCI whereby the Lesion is the lesion is mechanically revascularized with the introduction of a balloon and a stent. Primary PCI then is the standard of care for STEMI uh, as found in the guidelines of both the American Heart Association and the European Society of Cardiology. And primary PCI would be uh, PCI uh, given promptly uh, after the infarction and as the only modality of treatment. The HSE, a number of years ago, instituted a national program for acute coronary syndrome with the aim of uh, increasing between 30 and 80 percent the percentage of STEMI patients in Ireland who receive primary PCI. And this was done both by uh, the streamlining of delivery of patients to the hospital and diagnosis and with regards to today's talk, um, the availability of primary PCI facilities. Uh, and today we're talking about, this is, sorry, this is the website for the program. Today we're talking about the opening of the 24-hour coronary catheterization lab at the UHL, and this happened in October of 2012, uh, which was facilitated by the acute coronary syndrome program by the HSE. Um, the purpose of this study was to simply report on the changes in management uh, in the period before the opening of the 24-hour service and after. And this was done using a retrospective cohort of sequential STEMI admissions to the University Hospital Limerick. And the, we used the period of six months prior and six months post the opening. Pre was the defined term before, was April 1 to September 30, 2012, and post the period after October 1, 2012 to April 30, 2013. Our inclusion criteria were obviously a STEMI diagnosis on admission and admission during the period of interest. Our exclusion criteria were obviously a diagnosis other than STEMI, 
uh, and unfortunately that some of the an uh, angiographic data was unavailable on our system. We collected the angiographic data um, with direct review of angiograms on the, the lab system uh, and reviewing in concert with that the reports that came with those. So we actually uh, drew this from a much larger database that we received ethical approval for uh, of 241 STEMI admissions between January 2011 and April 2013. And of those 241, 128 landed within our period of interest. Uh, unfortunately, as I said previously, 10 uh, did not have angiographic data, which left us with 118. And we found that there were 64 admissions uh, prior or in the period after the opening of the new facility and 54 in the period prior to that. We described a disease presentation by way of the, uh, the prevalence of multivessel disease, which we saw as just under 50% in both groups before and after, and ejection fraction or left, left ventricular ejection fraction, which was clinically uh, identical between the two groups. So we categorized the uh, modalities of treatment uh, into eight different categories. Sort of, I've already described thrombolysis and primary PCI. I apologize for some of the terminology. Facilitated PCI would be um, uh, management of STEMI with the intention to use both, uh, sorry, first thrombolysis and then later use uh, PCI when it became available. Rescue PCI would be uh, initial thrombolysis and then failure of that thrombolysis as detected by 12 lead ECG, which then resulted in the use of PCI. Uh, and then cabbage medical management only uh, and a couple of, of uh, other categories there, failed PCI and late PCI. So you can see here, since we're talking about the gold standard modality of treatment, primary PCI increased significantly from the period before to the period after, uh, and accordingly uh, thrombolysis and facilitated PCI, which would both be use of thrombolytics, declined over the same period. So by way of discussion, we can analyze or we can look at uh, the HSC's own audit data for the entire country in which they saw an increase in the percent of STEMI patients that received primary PCI, this is across the whole country, um, from 67% to 82%. This would be the, their, their periods of investigation are different than ours. This would be sort of a period they chose before the rollout of the entire program and uh, after. And if we look at the UHL data, we can see that uh, the opening of our lab here uh, certainly has met the same uh, standard with regards to, uh, oops, sorry, with regards to the overall number of patients that are receiving primary PCI. And you could even consider that uh, with regards to sort of the, the change from prior to post <laughs> the bringing on of this service, uh, it might even be considered to exceed that uh, improvement. So in conclusion, we're happy to report that the 24-hour, uh, seven-day-a-week cardiac catheterization lab is successfully bringing primary PCI uh, as part of this program to patients in the Midwest uh, who previously didn't have the same accessibility to that uh, procedure. Uh, and this service uh, is providing STEMI care consistent with European Society of Cardiology guidelines. Thanks very much. I'm going to present to you today on carotid artery disease. So we're currently working towards the development of a preoperative diagnostic method to screen a carotid plaque for the risk of rupture and subsequent stroke. So stroke is a massive problem in Ireland. It currently affects 10,000 Irish people each year, where 2,000 of these strokes result in death. This is more deaths than cancer, prostate cancer and bowel cancer all combined. So on top of this, there is currently 30,000 people living with disabilities that are a result of a stroke. So there are two methods of treatment for this disease, the endarterectomy surgery or the minimally invasive carotid artery stenting. Now generally endarterectomy surgery is the procedure of choice. However, we need this stenting alternative as surgery is not always an option for the patient. So according to one of the largest randomized clinical trials that compared the outcome of stenting versus endarterectomy, it is found that there was a significantly higher rate of strokes associated with this stenting procedure. So this presents a critical issue. We need to identify the plaque types that are suitable for this minimally invasive stenting procedure. 
So currently, the method of preoperative diagnosis is based on <coughs> using medical imaging, normally ultrasound, where we define a plaque type, a percentage stenosis measure, and a surface irregularity estimate. So here's an example of six human carotid plaque samples that we have obtained from the University Hospital Limerick. And you can see how each plaque has been given a type and a percentage stenosis measure. But the key thing to note here is this, that this method of diagnosis offers no insight into the mechanical properties of the plaque. Now this is a problem because stenting is a mechanical procedure. It involves a circumferential stretching of the plaque in order to achieve the luminal gain. So we must therefore be able to predict the mechanical response of the plaque to this stretching procedure. So what we want to do is investigate the feasibility of relating the mechanical properties of the plaque to its composition. And in particular, we want to do use the calcification. So the motivation driving this study is that in an ideal scenario, we could image the patient specific plaque with this calcification detail. We would then be able to apply the mechanical data related to calcification inclusions for material models. And then we could assess the plaque's vulnerability and rupture risk during stenting. So ultimately, a clinician could make an informed decision as to whether the plaque is suitable for this minimally invasive stenting procedure. Okay, so what we did was, in order to mimic this stenting procedure, we circumferentially stretched the six crada plaques to complete failure. And from this, we got the mechanical response. So here you can see, this is uh, the mechanical response for the six plaques. And in highlighted in red, you can see that there was a large variance in the initial stiffness in the elastic region. So what we did was we divided the plaques into three subgroups based on this initial stiffness measure. And from this, I'll use these three subgroups to relate to the plaque's composition in order to try and figure out what was causing this large variance. So firstly, using FGIR, we measured the lipids and the calcification across the plaque's intimal surface. And what we found was, firstly with the lipids, there was a significant decrease with each increasing stiffness group. So what this tells us now, generally a high lipid measure uh, suggests a vulnerable plaque type and a lower lipid suggests a more advanced plaque type. So as this, the stiffness is increasing, we're getting a more advanced plaque. In terms of calcification, we found that there was a similar amount across each of the three stiffness groups. So what this tells us is that the intimal calcification is present in the advanced plaques, but it's also present in these vulnerable plaque types. So next then we scanned a section of each of the plaques using CT. And as you can see here, it, what it does is it reveals all the calcification at a high resolution inside these plaques. So we then segmented out the calcification for analysis. And I then investigated if there was a particular type of inclusion causing this increase in mechanical stiffness. So what we found was that there were three main types of inclusions in these plaques. There was the microspherical particles that were less than 300 microns. There were the sheet-like and these irregular shaped nodes. So firstly looking at the microparticles, we found that these were highly prevalent in the lowest stiffness group. And if you recall, these are the plaques with the highest lipid measures, which were the vulnerable type. Next was the medium stiffness group, where there was a significant drop in the amount of these microparticles. But then again, at the highest stiffness group, there was a, a jump again in the number of these particles. To explain this trend, what appears to happen is these microparticles are aggregating and forming larger inclusions as the plaques are advancing. So just to show you, this is an example of an inclusion from the lowest stiffness group. And you can see how, how it's starting to form. But then in the medium stiffness, there was larger fully formed inclusions and then in the highest stiffness group you have a mixture you have these fully formed nodes but you also have these microparticles forming in on top of it and it's basically taking over the internal volume of the plaque so we conclude from this that as the calcification volumes are increasing it's causing an increase in the mechanical stiffness of the plaques so then, in terms of failure, we investigated the mechanical vulnerability that these inclusions were causing on the plaque. And what we found was, for these larger, irregularly shaped nodes, these were the cause of ultimate plaque rupture. So we hypothesize here that these calcification deposits are acting as stress rises in the plaque. They're limiting the stretching, which is causing this increase in stiffness. And they're causing an increase in strain on the surrounding soft tissue, which is causing this ultimate failure. We also looked at the microparticles um, just to see here three that were in close proximity, you can see um, 
we found that there was a localised deformation of the collagen fibres in between these calcification particles. But if you can see the three um, circles, and it might be hard, but you can see how the calcification and the collagen fibres have failed. So this presents a high risk scenario. So you, if you could imagine that these micro failures occurring in the high lipid vulnerable plaques, it would expose the internal plaque to the blood flow and this could lead to thrombosis or emboli which could subsequently result in a stroke. So in summary, <coughs> we found that an increase in the mechanical stiffness was related to the increase in calcification size and volume. In terms of failure, we found that the irregularly shaped nodes were highly prevalent in the more advanced plaque types, and these were the cause of ultimate plaque failure. The microparticles were highest in the vulnerable, low stiffness plaques with high lipid measures, and these caused micro failures in the collagen, which could be a precursor for stroke. So in conclusion, um, this study has shown us that it's feasible to use calcification size and morphology, and it may help us in the future to predict the high risk plaques um, that are vulnerable for this denting procedure. So I'd just like to take the chance to make the final acknowledgements and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Hello, um, I'm Christine DC from um, the University of Limerick. And um, as I said, my presentation is on psychological distress and lifestyle behaviour of undergraduate university students. And I'd like to acknowledge my uh, research supervisors, uh, Barry Coughlin and uh, Patricia Mannix McNamara at the University of Limerick. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Didier Jordan and Julie Pernon from the University of Blaise Pascal in Claremont Ferrand, um, who worked with me on this paper. Okay, so just in terms of a little bit of background, I suppose, uh, we're all well aware of the impacts of poor diet, physical inactivity, smoking, alcohol consumption in relation to disease, um, mortality and uh, morbidity. And um, uh, these uh, risk behaviours are also problematic among uh, third level students, as has been identified in the literature. And what I was interested in really was um, to determine if... Um, if they were also related to their uh, levels of psychological distress, which is also problematic um, among higher education students. Um, in fact, it has been identified now that higher education students have poorer psychological distress than the general population um, throughout the world, really. And um, it has also been identified that those programmes that have practicum components, um, such as nursing and teaching, teacher education, say for example, are particularly vulnerable um, to stress and to psychological distress. And if we look at uh, some of the contributory factors that are there, are things like academic and course related stressors. Um, it's also very much, as you would be aware, a period of transition, a transition from home to college, from second level to third level education, um, from adolescence into adulthood, and uh, that brings with it um, uh, major stressors, I suppose. It's also a time of financial uncertainty and, um, as we're all aware, um, poor employment prospects at the moment, pressures to do well and so on also add to this. And uh, for those students who are engaged in programmes with practicum components, um, they also have the additional practicum related stressors. And um, the evidence suggests, I suppose, that distress experienced by higher education students um, leads to the adoption of risk behaviours uh, such as smoking, hazardous drinking and uh, poor dietary habits. And, but I suppose what's not really known about is how these actually cluster together, how the uh, psychological distress and the coping behaviours uh, of the students and their lifestyles actually cluster. Um, and that's the focus really of this uh, study which looked at uh, lifestyle behaviours and its relationship to psychological distress and to coping. Um, so basically looked at uh, each of those variables and the relationship between them. So it was a cross-sectional study design and uh, we need to bear that in mind in terms of limitations uh, when we're looking at, uh, at the findings. Um, I used three instruments, the general health questionnaire to measure psychological distress, ways of coping instrument um, to measure um, coping processes, and a lifestyle behaviour questionnaire, uh, which uh, was a self-report measure of a student 
lifestyle behaviours, uh, based, uh, questions based on uh, previously used uh, instruments. Um, so the sample was all undergraduate nursing, midwifery and teacher education students at the University of Limerick and ethical approval was granted by the UL uh, Research Ethics Committee. Um, in terms of analysis then, um, obviously there was a descriptive analysis for each of the different variables, uh, bivariate anal analysis to look at uh, the links between lifestyle and the uh, demographic in indicator of stress and coping, um, logistic regression um, analysis, uh, multiple <coughs> correspondence analysis and cluster analysis. Um, all these are supposed to look at uh, more in depth um, the uh, relationships between the different uh, variables. Okay, so then in terms of findings, and um, I'm just presenting a selection of uh, the findings um, here today. Um, the paper has, has just been published in Health Promotion International um, in the last week, so um, if you want more um, details in relation to, to the findings, you, you will find them there. Um, so in terms of the, the uh, profile, we have the response rate of 71% uh, of the say, profile of the students, um, higher percentage of teacher education students than uh, nursing students. Um, again, higher percentage of females than males, and mostly under the age of 26, single and born in Ireland. Um, the, um, the study indicated, I suppose, that there was a fairly high prevalence of risk behaviours. Um, as you can see there, high, high levels of alcohol consumption, um, unhealthy diet, physical inactivity, uh, smoking, cannabis use. Um, I suppose what I was really concerned about was the high levels of psychological distress that was indicated with 41.9% um, uh, of the students scoring higher than 5 on the general health questionnaire. Um, females um, were found to be more distressed than males and the nursing students were more distressed than their teacher education uh, counterparts. Um, then the bivariate um, analysis, I suppose, it identified significant relationships uh, between lifestyle and a range of demographic uh, indicators, the GHQ and, and coping. And I'm just going to pick um, a few here. Say, for example, um, in relation to residents, um, students residing in student accommodation were more likely to smoke and to drink alcohol than those residing elsewhere. Um, in relation to programme of study, uh, teacher education students were more likely to rate their diet as very healthy um, and to describe themselves as being physically active and nursing students were more likely to smoke. Um, in relation to gender then again, um, uh, male um, students were more likely to rate their diet as healthy. Um, females had lower levels of physical activity and you can see the odds ratio there in terms of the regression analysis. Um, Females were more likely uh, to smoke and uh, they consumed less alcohol than males. Um, younger students were more likely to eat convenience food um, and to be physically active. The older students were more likely to smoke and um, the younger students more likely to use um, alcohol. Um, so as I've said, there are nursing students um, more physically inactive and um, uh, higher rates of smoking. And um, so, in relation to we just look at uh, there in year four, um, we can see that um, students in year four um, had a high level of uh, eating convenience foods, um, which possibly may be linked to the the um, high levels of stress in year four. Um, interesting here in relation to uh, employment and lifestyle, and I'm just going to pick out one. But um, students who work part time consumed more alcohol. Um, than those who had the, a grant or family support. Um, so I just thought that um, that was interesting. Um, was it the availability of more money? Um, but uh, their alcohol consumption rates were higher. And um, I suppose what was also interesting was that um, if students engaged in one risk behaviour, um, it appeared to increase the risk for all other, all other um, risk behaviours. Um, for example, there, um, those who had... Um, Unhealthy diets also had low levels of physical activity and um, and smoking, and um, tobacco smokers um, were also more likely to um, drink. Um, so um, again, I was very interested in the levels of psychological distress, and that correlated with poor diet, um, increased consumption of convenience food, physical inactivity, and tobacco smoking. 
and um, also their negative, um, I suppose, passive coping strategies were related to poor diet and so on. Um, I'm just going to um, identify, I suppose, that the, the cluster analysis um, identified that there were two groups <coughs> of students, those with risk behaviours and those with positive health behaviours. And unfortunately, as you can see, um, those with the risk behaviours were the bigger group and combined with the uh, poor lifestyle behaviours were psychological distress and uh, passive coping. Okay, that was just a diagrammatic uh, representation of the cluster analysis and the um, multiple correspondence analysis. Um, I just on a final note, I suppose, what can we, what can we draw from this? Um, because there is, a, I suppose, a significant evidence of clustering of risk behaviours here, um, it is really important, I think, that we look at interventions that target multiple as opposed to single risk behaviours and acknowledge the distress. Thank you. And um, I'm just uh, finishing my ma I just finished my master's in, at UL in the Department of Life Sciences, uh, and it was looking at correlations between vitamin K status and uh, cognition, and also between cognition correlations between cognition and inflammation. Uh, so just a little word about what vitamin K actually is. Uh, it's a fat soluble vitamin. Uh, there are two main isoforms. Phyloquinone and minoquinone. Uh, phyloquinone is the predominant isoform we find in our food, uh, and it's vitamin K1, and uh, it's found in dark green leafy vegetables. And uh, minoquinone or vitamin K K2, it's a type that's synthesized bacterially, um, uh, so it's found in fermented products, and also uh, it's uh, produced indigenously by our gut microbiota. So just a bit on the role of vitamin K. Uh, it acts as a cofactor uh, for the enzyme glutamyl carboxylase. Uh, so glutamyl carboxylase acts on um, vitamin K dependent proteins like osteocalcin. Uh, so it converts them um, from their uncarboxylated state into their carboxylated state, which activates them. Uh, so uh, before vitamin K acts on them, they're non-functional, and then it acts on they are become functional. Uh, and the classical role of vitamin K, like chronic role, I suppose, is in uh, coagulation, uh, but in recent years it's been it's been it's become known for additional functions uh, such as uh, incognition and inflammation. Um, so um, uh, vitamin K, it originally was research research began in vitamin K uh, for its role in cognition because uh, minoquinone 4 MK4, um, an isoform of vitamin K2. Uh, was uh, found to be the main storage point for in the body was the brain. Uh, so this would suggest a role for um, uh, vitamin K in cognition. Uh, so uh, studies went on to show that there is an association between low vitamin K status um, and poor cognition. And one of the mechanisms of action for this is, was, is believed to be um, the role of vitamin K in sphingolipid synthesis. So sphingolipids are um, they are lipids in the brain and um, they're found in cell membranes and in the central nervous system they're found in cell membranes and they, um, they act in uh, cell signaling. Um, uh, the anti-inflammatory role of vitamin K which has been demonstrated both in vivo and in vitro has also been postulated as a potential, um, as a potential means of preventing cognitive decline. Uh, so uh, just a bit about our, the aims of our study. So the aims of the study were to examine the associations between vitamin K status, both dietary and serum, and then measures of infl inflammation, or me measures of cognition, and additionally we, we measured uh, me measures of cognition um, against inflammation. So we correlated cognition and inflammation. Uh, so the elder, we used the elder male cohort who are um, a well-characterized uh, group of subjects um, aged greater than 65 years old, and we, um, we stratified them based on mini mental state exam. So those of severe uh, cognitive decline were classified, uh, were represented by an MMSE score of less than 15, and uh, the higher thresholds went on to represent moderate, mild, and good cognition. Uh, so just a bit about our uh, methods that we used. Um, Dietary vitamin K1 uh, was um, evaluated uh, using food frequency questionnaires. Um, 
serum phylloquinone was determined by HPLC. So dietary phylloquinone and serum phylloquinone are short-term measures of uh, vitamin K. So they will tell you if you've eaten broccoli yesterday, they'll tell you, <coughs> they'll show it up in your blood and, in, um, and you'll report it back but they're not considered good um, indicators of long-term vitamin K status. So we mentioned earlier that vitamin K status is involved in the carboxylation of um, vitamin K-dependent proteins, and one of these vitamin K-dependent proteins is osteocalcin. So in order to measure uh, long-term vitamin K status, we measured the level of undercarboxylated and carboxylated osteocalcin, and uh, the relative proportion um, of this indicated um, long-term vitamin K status. We also measured high sensitivity C-reactive protein, um, a biomarker of inflammation, and this was determined by ELISA. Uh, we chose um, high sensitivity C-reactive um, protein because it has been uh, found to be associated with the um, uh, plaques in those with Alzheimer's, so it's, and the neurofibrillary um, uh, tangles of those with Alzheimer's, so there is considered to be a potential association between HSDRP and cognition. Uh, and statistical analysis was conducted using SPSS. Uh, so just some of the results are outlined here. Um, so uh, we have our short-term measures of vitamin K status up here measured against MMSC category. So there were significant differences noticed across the, across the cognitive groups and as well for um, percentage UCOC or the uncarboxylated osteocalcin. Uh, there were significant um, difference, differences noted here. Uh, because in the study, uh, the study cohort contained a subgroup which were free living and also a subgroup uh, which were uh, in long term in long term institutions. So because of this, we had to um, adjust for age and um, comorbidity, uh, so age and general sickness level. And when we did this, we found that um, that the uh, level of dietary phylloquinone, uh, there was still a significant difference across um, MMSE category. And our next slide uh, shows, the, uh, shows the similar analysis which was conducted um, comparing MMSE category with um, biomarkers of inflammation. So we did our HSCRP, uh, IL-6, uh, IL-8, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. And uh, significant differences were noticed across the MMSE groups uh, for all of these <coughs> biomarkers of inflammation. And because again, we had both a long-term, we had both a free living and long-term institutionalized um, subgroups within our cohort, we um, adjusted for, um, we adjusted for age and comorbidity again. And um, we noticed, uh, the, um, when we did this, we noticed that the, well, uh, the HSCRP, the IL, and the tumor necrosis factor alpha, they were still ha showed significant differences across MMSE category, and um, IL-6 was shown to be uh, the most discerning um, uh, when it came to the different levels of cognition. So it was the most it was the most significantly discerning um, biomarker of inflammation across the cognitive groups. Uh, so in conclusion, we show that vitamin K status varies. Um, across cognitive uh, groups with poor vitamin K status, those with poor vitamin K status showing lower levels of cognition. And, um, and this is in accordance with um, recent research uh, into vitamin K status. Uh, and the dif significant differences in biomarkers inflammation, including uh, HSCRP, IL-8, IL-6, and T T tumor necrosis factor alpha were shown between all MMSC categories and IL-6 was shown to be the most discerning biomarker of cognitive ability. <coughs> and uh, so some good um, points about our study was a relatively large sample size and also that we use both long-term and short-term measures of inflammation, of long-term and short-term measures of vitamin K status. <coughs> Um, and but the, it was uh, cross-sectional, so it would be lovely to uh, if someone were to do a longitudinal study on um, vitamin K status uh, uh, when it comes to information and cognition, because it hasn't been done yet. And this study will go on. The um, analysis will be conducted to um, to correlate vitamin K status in the future with inflammation.
so just to acknowledge our collaborators in CIT, UCC, the University of Montreal, and as well the Allen Foundation uh, for, for funding the project. And thanks for listening, and I can take any questions. Thank you.